and welcome to another edition of the Surge. I am Mondo, the Monster from Dina, along with my tag team partners, as always. He is the Hall of Fame coach, Tony Girava, and El Autobus, Kristen Molina. Coach, we'll start with you, brother. How do you feel today? Oh, feeling good. Feeling good. Just uh, getting ready to get through the week. Started basketball, you know, so it's, it's getting interesting. Picking up now. Hey, Boos, how do you feel, baby? Good. I mean, it's, it's been an interesting week. Uh, like you said, like Coach said, started basketball this week. I picked up a little bit more coverage for basketball as well, and uh, looking forward to ramping it up. Seems like we took a little bit of a break, but it's uh, it's gone by quickly. Here we go for the next portion of the spring season. And you got to be excited there, your sports fan, because like I said, we move on from football to basketball. And coaches, you alluded to that. We started our high school basketball coverage uh, yesterday as we are doing this on a Wednesday. So, gentlemen, let's begin. Uh, couple things to uh, talk about today but first let's just recap what happened uh, a week ago on Friday and that was the uh, 90th installment of the Tony the Tiger Sumble and uh, Christian you were there and give me your thoughts overall of the uh, Tony the Tiger Sumble. You know I thought the environment uh, was one of the best environments we've seen uh, sold out uh, it was oversold uh, according to the official attendance at 48,000 when I know the capacity is 45. So that just gives you a glimpse of, of how that environment felt. Uh, you know, the energy was up, but unfortunately Oregon state with all the opt outs didn't live up to the billing. I think everything else did. The sun was out. It was beautifully packed. CBS did a tremendous job. The bands did a tremendous job. Just Oregon state could not find any offense and they, they struggled defensively. Uh, but I thought the environment was one of the best bowls we've seen on TV on how it looked and how it was presented. Just unfortunate that it wasn't a close game at all. Yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, basically Oregon State didn't show up. Coach, your thoughts, Ed, because I know you saw it on TV. Your thoughts as you're watching this on CBS. Yeah, it, it looked great as far as uh, on TV. Uh, you know, we, we were celebrating my uh, my, my daughter's uh, birthday, so uh, we had a little luncheon, got together, and uh, you know, watched the game. I, you know, Notre Dame is a little bit different for me. It's a little bit special. My, my dad was a, a, a huge uh, uh, Notre Dame fan. He graduated from Cathedral High School, and uh, one of the things that uh, that comes to mind every time I see Notre Dame is uh, my dad had a harmonica, and he learned how to play by himself, and and so we'd sit down and watch uh, a Notre Dame game. And every score, he he bring out his harmonica and, and he play the fight song. It was it was it was it really it was just awesome and you know a lot of memories uh, last Friday and watching that game and you know thinking about him and I'm sure he was rooting for Notre Dame as well. Uh, that's awesome. That's a great story, Coach. I'm gonna retell that yeah. to people when when I see them. Now, uh, Christian, one of the things and, and also Coach, one of the things that surprised me is like you said is how Oregon State basically didn't show up. A lot of El Paso wins, actually, you know, that's like, let's just talk, say it is what it is. They're a Cowboy Town, they're a Laker Town, they're, mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure who, the Yankee Town, I guess, Dodger Town or whatever, Notre Dame Town as well. So uh, most of the most of the crowd there was very happy that Notre Dame put a little butt whip in um, Oregon State. And like I said, I was very surprised that Oregon State basically didn't show up, you know, but you know, Christian, like, but first of all, let me say it was a win for the city of El Paso. As we talked about it, Christian, we wrapped it up, did the uh, post game. A win for the city of El Paso, you know, beautiful day. The sun finally came back, you know, and it was just, it was hot. I had to take out one of my jackets, things of that nature. So it was a tremendous event. Congratulations to everybody involved. And also, like, it went off without a hitch, pregame, postgame, and all that good stuff. But what type of experience did you have a little behind the scenes there, Christian? What was it like for you? Uh, what duties did you get to uh, do? Because uh, you are actually working for CBS Sports. Yeah, I mean, uh, without a hitch, I think uh, when you have the headset, uh, the production headset, you would have thought nothing was going right uh, pregame. Uh, <laughs> to give you kind of a thing is they were trying to get the teams out of the locker room because they were trying to sync it up with their live shot and their introductory shot. They wanted to have Oregon State run out when the band was playing and put the graphic up. And I could hear the guy, you know, hey, get Oregon State out. And he's like, I, I'm trying to, but the kids won't listen. Yada, yada, yada. They're, they're trying to break the huddle in, in the tunnel. And the producer's just telling them, dude, get them out of that tunnel. And then Notre Dame, it was the same thing, that they were waiting on somebody. Somebody's shoe got untied. They didn't want to go out uh, without everybody being out there. And the guy was, like, telling them, oh, my God, we're not going to have the live shot. And people are panicking. So, you, you know, it looks like it goes without a hitch. And then, two, the, the helicopter's going over. They were early. You can hear them screaming, telling the guy, hey, 
let the <laughs> let the let the helicopter circle, let the helicopter circle. They're too early, and then they ended up coming too late. So it's kind of funny. I had the easiest <laughs> job in the world, which was ninety minutes till kickoff. Uh, make sure the clock on the field was synchronized with the clock in the truck. That was my one job. Then my second job was to sync the halftime clock with the production clock and just babysit and make sure that what was on the field was being relayed to what was in the truck. That was my job. Easiest job in the world. Funny story is the guy that normally does this job was telling a couple of people, hey, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I've done this job for so many years. It's the easiest job in the world. I hope they don't move me from it. And me, of all people, in in the tent before, was like, well, I'm sure, you know, if you've done it forever – you don't have to you don't have to worry about it man like it's, it's your job you know and we go to the production meeting and it like it switches like it just has my name under clock and he looks at me and he's like is that you and i was that is me and he's like i'll i'll trade you right now and i said obviously i'm not gonna trade you because you really want this job and it seems super easy so i'm not gonna i'm not moving off my spot man so i thought That's that was hilarious. the funniest i thought it was funny but you know it, it looked awesome from where i was again i got to yep. just babysit uh, the clock operator was below me. I had the headset on, and I'm communicating with the truck, and everything went smooth. So I enjoyed my time. That's awesome. That's that's great to hear. I always mm-hmm. like the behind the scenes stuff. That's why when you see documentaries, when they put them together, about what it actually takes to put a sporting event or a movie or a concert right. together, those are very interesting because people don't realize how hard it actually is to mm-hmm. put something on so the fact that it looks like it goes off without, without a hitch it just tells you how much work there really is going up into it but i do want you to relay me a story that you told me when we're on the field then coach I, I don't think you heard about this and of course you talked about all the opt-outs for notre dame and, and oregon state but one in particular you know was a, a particular a, a person and i'll be honest with you, i didn't even know who it was you know i saw people taking pictures of them and stuff like that and then they finally i finally asked i think colin from uh, channel nine is like who's that dude bro and then he told me and it was the uh regular starting quarterback for the northern right. white the irish <laughs> who decided not to play in that game so and uh you think that that, that kind of like made me like what like well you obviously he didn't travel with the team he traveled mm-hmm. on his own he was on the sidelines but it seemed to me more christian like he kind of regretted not being in the game because of how well the city of El Paso was treating this, uh, the fighting Irish. Yeah, I, I think there was a little bit of regret. You know, uh, Angeli, the quarterback that was the backup, did a tremendous job, right? We talked about this yep. was his time to shine. They were calling him Peter Butter and Jelly uh, behind the production truck. Uh, hopefully that name sticks because it's, it's, it's awesome. But Sam Hartman approached uh, the sideline reporters from CBS and said that he was willing to do – an interview uh, <laughs> if there was time and as coach laughs I mean that's just that's kind of funny and I remember hearing them saying hey Sam Hartman's next to us he says that he's good to do an interview and the response was uh, if we have time we'll get to him but I don't really see the point of talking to him right now <laughs> and you know, excuse me and and then Notre Dame kind of blew it up in the fourth quarter and they said well we we ran out of commercials I guess we can talk to Sam so we'll go to Sam <laughs> Uh, that, I just find that very funny, Coach, that yeah. the fact that he yeah, wants to show up and all of a sudden, I want some attention, I want some attention. Now, he was yep. getting a lot of attention from the fans uh, after the game as well, but I just think it's a missed opportunity for him not to play Absolutely. in the game and hopefully learn the lesson. Right. And uh, like, like I said, like I don't even know if he's going to be drafted. I think he's going to go uh, – maybe he's going to be one of the, the – what they uh, undrafted, but he, they might – somebody's going to give him a shot, though, you see. Yeah. Uh, speaking yeah. of, before we, we move on uh, to an you because I know they uh, – Introduced a new coach there. Uh, I do want to mention that XFL. We talked about this, guys. We talked about this. We did last year about how the XFL yep. and USFL they should just merge, and so they did exactly that. I think it, when did they announce it? Like maybe like in September or whatever. But officially on Sunday, they actually came out with the name. It's now going to be called the United Football League. So makes sense, you know. And XFL was. I thought I felt XFL was more successful than USFL because XFL they actually played the games at different cities. Uh, USFL, they played uh, the first year, I think they played only in Memphis. Then the second year, they played in uh, in Birmingham. So things of that mm-hmm. nature. So I'm very excited to see that because I did follow uh, XFL more than USFL. 
Uh, so I'm very excited to see what happens about that. So I just want to throw that out there. That's now the United yep. Football League. Uh, I think mm-hmm. the first game is like in April, something of that nature. So, Christian, let's talk very quickly because I know you talked about it last week, and that is NMSU uh, having a brand new football coach. I believe Tony Sanchez is his name. Right. So, uh, uh, you you were able to uh, see the part of the uh, press conference, Christian. Give us a little rundown of what you saw, what and your first impressions. Essentially, I mean, Tony Sanchez has always been active on social media, so you kind of always see who he is. Again, he went to NMSU in the '90s. He coached at UNLV. Coached at Bisham Gorham in Las Vegas, and he was very successful as a head coach. Last year, he was a wide receivers coach under Jerry Kill, um, and this year he's going to translate as the head coach. And uh, Nate Dryling, the defensive coordinator, I know that Coach Grijalva saw him talk last yes. year. He's going to he's going to be moving up to associate head coach slash defensive coordinator. So they kind of moved everybody up uh, along the way with him. But you know, I thought he was very truthful. He, you know, he mentioned Diego Pavia. He mentioned a lot of guys that hit the portal. He basically said he had a good conversation with Diego Pavia. He wished him well, but that there was other people that wanted to be Aggies and they were going to draw their attention that way. Um, right now, Eli Stowers, is the four-star transfer from Texas A&M. He's the only quarterback in the room right now. So they're, they are looking. He says whether you like it or not, the NIL is here to stay and they need money for the NIL. And they, I thought what he said was kind of what Aggie Nation needed to hear in a sense was, uh, we don't hope to win. We expect to win. The foundation's been laid, so we need to continue what was laid before us. And he was with Kill since the very beginning at NMSU, so he's familiar with it. Like I said, they bumped everybody up. The running backs coach is now their offensive coordinator. Their offensive line coach is an associate head coach for the offensive side. So everybody kind of got the bump that they needed. Mario Mocha, the AD, also said that there's two big things coming with NMSU football and I believe it's a huge facilities upgrade and a new Jumbotron and that there was more on the way to renovate the program. So it, it seemed like a positive con- uh, press conference. And it looks like Tony Sanchez has, you know, he went 20 and 40 at UNLV. But I think at that time, UNLV wasn't even taking football serious. But I think now mm-hmm. is a good opportunity, him as an alum, uh, to represent NMSU. It, it seemed pretty positive all the way around. And coach, I think it's yep. big for uh, NMSU with the fact that they keep somebody not only that was from staff and promoting, which honestly, honestly I think that's the way it should be, but also the fact that yep. he, he actually played for the Aggies as well. Yeah, I I totally agree. Uh, it, I was, as was mentioned, you know, the foundation has been laid by Coach Kill, and and now it's just up to him to yeah to continue and uh, raise the level of the program, and and hopefully he'll have the opportunity to do that in, in the future. All right, we'll, we'll stay there with NMSU. Uh, you, uh, Christian, you forgot something. You were going to mention uh, something. Yeah, I, I think it was interesting, though, what he mentioned was that two years back when he arrived at NMSU, he said it was kind of interesting to see the locker rooms hadn't changed. So I think that that's a huge thing. That's a that's a shot at the administration and everybody yep. else to kind of they need – uh, to upgrade when you look at like Alabama's locker room or Oregon's locker room I know that they're not on the same level but you can't recruit with a with a 90s locker room they got to have some upgrades I'm not saying they need top of the line upgrades but for him to say hey the locker room still look the same from the 90s is not something you want to hear <laughs> and, and I'll be a thousand percent honest with you these kids they want to be treated especially now with the NIL and the spec for the fact that some of them can make money they want to be tr- treated like pro, even though they're not pro athletes they want to be treated like they're pro athletes. And even down to the high school level, that's why you see all the graphics, all the recruiting services, all the stuff that happens, you know, in every school, whether they like it or not, they have to do it now. You know, even when it's a birthday, they got to do a graphic for the birthday and every school does it, you know, game day graphics, all the type of stuff. Cause the kids want to feel important, but yeah, the locker rooms, you got, you got to fix those up, man. Come on now. It's been <laughs> almost 30 years. You got to come on and miss you fix that up. I'm sure they're That's one of the things that they're going to feel. Cause yeah, when you got a kid yep. coming in, he's going to see it's like, nombre, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Cause then when you see uh, the other facilities, you know, it just doesn't compare. All right. So let's, let's stay there with Las Cruces. Big battle uh, happening tomorrow. Basketball wise, the Utah Miners take on NMSU, the battle of I-10. Now it's going to be different, gentlemen, because now part of Conference USA. So, uh, Coach, we'll yeah. get your thoughts on this game. But let me just point out that uh, the, the, both teams have been struggling as of late. The Utah Miners yeah. just got – they got embarrassed. I'm just going to tell you what it is. They got embarrassed by Seattle University. Seattle University hadn't won a road game in the entire year, and they go out there and put a shellacking. Uh, that's a nice way to see it. The score really didn't look like that, but 
It really wasn't close. It was at one point, uh, Seattle U led by 26 points. So I'm sure Coach Golden was very upset with that, how, how, how that transpired. Because honestly, it's one of those where like they had tremendous shots. They just weren't going in. But still, how do you see this going on? Battle by 10 and MSU, uh, part one there at New Mexico State, Coach. Well, what, you're, what we're looking at here is a uh, the situation of a coach in New Mexico State first year, uh, a whole new team, whole new program coming in. So you know they, they they've got to learn to play with each other. So that that's that's a little bit different. On the other hand, you got the UTEP team who who's pretty much been together. Coach Goldie's been there what three years now. Uh, I, I just think that the Miners need to find some type of consistency somewhere. You know, that there's some nights when when they go out there and you know they give it a full effort. Uh, their shots are going down. You know their free throws are going down. And everything looks good, and all of a sudden it just you know things seem to go south on them. Yeah, and it seemed to me they kind of it seemed to me like it just felt like they might have overlooked uh, Seattle U. And then this uh, one player, uh, Cameron Tyson, I believe was his name, and it said on the scouting report he's a tremendous three-point player and that's exactly what he was doing all night he lit him up yeah. boost your thoughts battle y10 utep versus nmsu part one tomorrow night you know uh, coach mentioned you know coach hooten's first year for him uh, and they've gone through a lot of growing pains and it's kind of unfamiliar territory for nmsu to have a sort of a lackluster start when it comes to basketball, usually it's the other way around. We're talking football's lackluster, basketball's everything for uh, Las Cruces, and this year it kind of flipped. But I think Coach Hooten has a really good uh, nucleus around him. He has got a good core. They just the thing about NMSU is they turn the ball over late. They foul late, uh, and, and so when they have the lead or they're close to getting there, they kind of tumble. Uh, last week uh, they played Stephen F. Austin, and I think that was the most complete game that I saw NMSU play up until this point. And I thought that they closed it out well. I, I, You know, they played UNM a couple of weeks back after getting bombarded by them. They lost by near 50. And then they, they come back and they lose by two uh, in the second go-around with UNM. So they, they've improved steadily. I don't know if it's enough, though, even though UTEP is sort of on a downslide right now after starting 5-0. and oh, I don't know if they have enough right now to get them. But I think it'll be pretty close. But I think right now the threat is you mentioned the three points that Seattle had. And uh, right now NMSU is missing that three-point uh, sort of rhythm. They're not hitting those shots consistently. And so I think right now the matchup favors UTEP just a bit. Uh, but this will be a good test for Hooten. He likes these part ones and twos because he can adjust and come back and play them closer in part two. So uh, I think it will be an interesting close matchup tomorrow. By the way, I was checking to see if what was the line in on ESPN. There is no line. Uh, they they have no line, so I'm, I'm seeing it. I guess it's even, you know, and that's rare because normally they would put uh, a line on this. I thought the line yep. was like, I think it was UTEP, like maybe three points at the beginning of the week. I guess people are going the other way. Uh, but anyways, I uh, look the situation. We'll see. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, the women will be taking on the Battle of I-10 on Saturday and it'll be the women uh, traveling to El Paso for that one. You can, hey, I'll be doing that one on ESPN Plus if you have time, watch it. Uh, now let's move on to the NFL. A lot of stuff going on in the National Football League that I want to talk about. Uh, we'll begin first, and we'll get it. We'll get the most obvious thing out of the way. What happened with Dallas Cowboys and the Detroit Lions? Because not only do I believe that Detroit kind of got robbed, they got robbed. Uh, I I think because you don't know how the game would have really ended because Dallas would have gotten the ball back with about 30 seconds or 24, whatever it was, you know, and who knows what Dak Prescott and the mm -hmm. offense would have been able to do, especially with C.D. Lamb. And then you've got a kicker who's a rookie, but let's just call it what it is. He's been perfect, and he's made field yeah, goals good. from 60, 60 plus yards, you know, so you just never know how mm -hmm. the game would, would have ended. But for me to say – yeah, he that I think that the call was wrong, and I think Detroit was robbed of a one point lead over the Dallas Cowboys. But because of that happened, it changed the entire dynamic of the NFL playoffs. Now, because of the Cowboys' win on Sunday, thanks to the Eagles choking against the Arizona Cardinals, now the Cowboys win. 
the road stays in Dallas up until if they get to the NFC Championship game against San Francisco. So it's a huge situation there. But first, mm-hmm. Coach, we'll start with you. When you saw this going on, that uh, they're saying that the offensive lineman didn't check in. He said he did, and they called the other one. Uh, nonetheless, it's not <laughs> reviewable. As all this was going down, what were you thinking, Coach? Well, actually, uh, my first thoughts at that time were, you know, the, the, the Detroit Detroit knew what they were doing. You know, how many times do you see do you see a team have two uh, in a, two ineligibles uh, report as a, as an eligible receiver? Supposedly, that's what happened. I I, I really don't know. I, to me, the the way that I look at it from a coaching standpoint is, you know, you try and and get as close to that line without crossing it as you can. Yeah. You know, uh, it to in order to confuse. Really, there should be, I don't know, in my mind, there should be no confusion because if, if your defense is coached well, you should know who's at the line, at the end of the line of scrimmage and who's eligible and who's not. That To me, that it's it's that simple. Anything else about reporting and, and those kinds of things, I, I mean, I, I don't know. There's there's different stories that I've heard about that. You know, and, and like I said, you know, there are some coaches that, that like to press that line and, and see what they can get away with. And, and that was a big play. That was a big situation in the game. I, I mean, I, I'm just saying that that's that, that those are exactly my thoughts. The thing that got me, Christian, is the fact that they're trying to fool the Cowboys. But at the end of the day, it's the official's job. Even if you try to do it because they sent three, they seen they sent three out there to the official and the official kind of brushed them off. He only noticed number 70. First of all, the official should have just owned that I messed up. You know, I'm human. But of course, he's right. not going to do that. But the thing that got me is that you can play all this trickery or whatever. The officials still have to tell the defense who's eligible. They literally walk over to the defense. All right, 68 eligible, eligible, 70 reported, and that's it. Sometimes they announce it to everybody in the entire stadium. Right. Boost, your thoughts as all this was going down? I think it was frustrating for Dan Campbell. Apparently, he drew this up in pregame for the refs. Um, and I think it was also bad on – Brad Allen for not getting the correct message across. He sort of just sees 70 coming his way and then he just kind of marches over. I think he should have uh, had that conversation with those three guys to figure out who's really eligible, who's not. Uh, Because, you know, we say it time and time again, we rather have the players decide who the win or loss goes to. We do not want to see the refs intervene uh, that late in the game. And I think Brad Allen dropped the ball. Um, ESPN called him out thoroughly after uh, for almost what it seemed like an hour of Scott, Scott Van Pelt calling him out uh, and Dan Campbell being frustrated in, in post game. And I just think that it really shouldn't have been confusion. I don't understand. I'm not a coach, so I don't understand why you would send three when one is or two are going to be eligible. I think it's just simpler to just send them both up but at that point they sent three up so i don't know which more the nfl refs want uh in that moment so i think it's very frustrating because you're right maybe they go to overtime maybe they don't go to overtime and the way they were going back and forth it was obviously one of the better games of the year uh this late with two playoff teams and i'm and i'm sort of upset at the fact that we didn't get to see good football continue instead we have to talk about the controversy of the nfl ref and and sometimes i wish they would remember we don't pay to go see the stripes we don't pay to see the players so i it's it's better for them to try to do their best and i know everybody's human and they make mistakes but in that moment with the clear evidence of all three guys walking up to them i just don't know how you get that wrong and the thing that gets me is like i said it impacts the playoffs and yes uh, if you're a cowboy fan you're going to be happy that it's favoring you because arizona did not only San Francisco a favor, oh, the yeah. Cowboys a favor, but now with Detroit, they could have ended the season if they would have won this, if they would have beat the Cowboys. They would have been the automatic, they would have been the number two seed. And that means that they would have hosted, well, they are going to host the game because they won their division. And then if they played in the divisional round, they'd host another game and they wouldn't have to go on the road until they played the San Francisco 49ers, which now the Dallas Cowboys find themselves in that position. And if the Cowboys don't accomplish that, like if they don't beat Washington, then they need to just get rid of people because there's no reason for that. Because as far as I'm concerned, the Cowboys, they should be in playoff mode starting this Sunday because everything's on the line for them because we've we've seen that they're not a good road team. Get into the playoffs and they see what you can do. But still, it's a shame. So now let's talk about you. And Christian, you mentioned it. Okay, so the first time it doesn't work, you know, they call the penalty. 
but you decide to go for it again. Interception. Then you get you get lucky. Micah Parsons was offside. Then you go for it again. At one point, do you not say, you know what? It's three strikes. It's two strikes. You know what? I don't want to risk the third. Let's just kick the field goal and send it to overtime. But it didn't happen. So, Coach, we'll start with you. Your thoughts, the fact that – and I, like I said, I respect Dan Campbell, and I love the fact that everybody, like the broadcasters, because I was actually at the Don Haskins Center, like in the parking lot. I just got in out of the arena, and I'm watching it on my phone. And I'm like – and everybody's talking about – I'm watching the Joe Buck and the Troy Ekman. I'm also listening to Babe Laufenberg on the radio because I'm trying to do both at the same time. And everybody was saying, if they score this touchdown, they're going to go for it without a doubt. So that happens. They didn't get it twice. Third time, you, you would have thought they would have tried to kick the field goal. Your <laughs> thoughts that they decided not to kick the field goal and go for the win? Well, you know, to me, from the from the coaching standpoint, coaching part of it, you know, if you have if it's to your advantage to go for two, you go for two. If you if you miss it, then you miss it. You've got to know what you're going to get yourself into. In my mind watching the whole game and I was going for Detroit to be honest with you. I was pulling for Detroit. I, I, I would have just, you know, looking at or looking at the situation, you know, if we go to overtime, who's gonna have the advantage in overtime? In my mind, I think I think that uh, Detroit would have had the advantage, whether they got the ball first or not. You know, offensively, they would have had the advantage. So why are you gonna risk it on one play as opposed to, you know, go ahead and play in the overtime and taking your chances there. I, I that's that's those are just my thoughts. I, I I don't know why why you would do that. Now, if, for example, if if uh if you if, if you uh, went and uh, scored the touchdown and you were going to kick the extra point and Dallas was offside and uh, so now you got half the distance to the goal, then you say you might think, well, okay, let, let's go for it. Let's give it a shot. It's a little bit easier. But you know, I, I don't know. To me, just the way you tried to do it. I, it just hit, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me. Boost your thoughts. Uh, you know, listen to him in his press conference. Listen to him on his uh, his radio weekly spot that he does. It was predetermined. He told the offense, "We're going to score. We're going to go for two. It was predetermined. He said he didn't regret it. He didn't regret it going three times. He kind of went off on the radio host. He told him, "Say it like you want to say it to me." Uh, like if we were face to face, and the guy told him it was reckless, and he said, "There you go, thank you." I, but I don't think it was reckless. He did, he's an aggressive coach. He goes for it more than anybody else on fourth down. Uh, me, I, I think I was telling my wife as we're watching, I said, "Man, just kick the field goal here." Uh, yeah. You know, God, God. If you don't believe in God, I mean, God was trying to tell you to kick the field goal. Right. But if you don't believe in God, if you believe in odds, whatever you believe in, there was three opportunities for you to kind of just kick the field goal, but. You know, he's an aggressive man. He wanted to make a statement, and I don't blame him for it. It's in his nature. It's not like, uh, you know, it, it was out of sorts, right? It's not like a guy that's yeah. not aggressive all of a sudden wants to be aggressive. Yeah. This is an aggressive guy, and this is his nature. So I, I really don't have a problem with it because that's who he is, and that's who the Lions are, and that's how they've gotten to be who they are is yeah. by being aggressive. And remember, they, they got like that by going for it in Green Bay, and they kicked, they knocked Green Bay out of the playoffs last year. We'll get to Green Bay in a couple of seconds, but Ooh, I'll be yeah. honest with you, as all this was going on, I never thought once about him kicking the field goal, I'll be honest with you, because <laughs> I knew he was going to go for it every single time. Now, the one thing that kind of, and they, they brought it up, but still, Cabo should have never been in that situation because of the, once oh, again, yes. poor, very poor clock management by Mike yes. McCarthy, just like last year in the playoffs. And now it's it now the I'm saying that for the Cowboys it's playoff time now and I'm saying I know they're in the playoffs but you get the opportunity to lock in that second seed and now everything you do now it's when it really matters the rest of the time you got there now everybody's gonna scrutinize every single thing this team does so now the pressure's on the Cowboys but still you know they got away with it they have a golden opportunity let's see if they can cash in so now let's talk about the last week of the regular seasons brought up a couple of teams that can get in believe it or not the Green Bay Packers after us as an up and down and down and up type of year that they've had. Mm -hmm. If they win, if they beat Chicago, they're in. And just like that, and more mm -hmm. likely, if the Cowboys, if the Cowboys take care of business, Green Bay takes care of business, that's going to be your week one matchup at Tag TNT Stadium. Aaron Jones, who has always <laughs> tremendous games against the Dallas Cowboys. He basically owns the Dallas Cowboys, taking on the Cowboys at at t Stadium. The only difference, Boost, is that Aaron Rodgers is not there. That's the main difference. Oh, Aaron Jones is going to be there. 
Aaron Rodgers is not going to be there. So I'm excited just for the sheer <laughs> anticipation that that could be the the week one, the wild card matchup for the Cowboys and the Green Bay uh, Packers. Your thoughts, Boos? Uh, I just wonder if your PTSD is activated yet uh, because of all <laughs> the times they've gone into Jerry's world and just kind of you know spun them on their head. I know Aaron Rodgers is not there. Jordan Love has gotten better with the season that's gone on. Um, they found their rhythm with Aaron and, and A.J. Dillon as a one-two punch, and Aaron seems to be as healthy as he's ever been this year. So, I mean, it's not – people look at it with – I know a couple of uh, people at work were kind of like their PTSD was starting to activate a little bit and, and saying, was this for sure? And, I, you know, yeah, the Green Bay going into Dallas is, is something scary, even though the boogeyman is not there anymore. It's still a scary thing because I know that there's been some guys that have played with Aaron Rodgers and they know – what it's going to take to upset the Cowboys. So I, I just think that it's a very interesting matchup. I don't care that it's a two and seven matchup. I think it's going to be one of the better games because of the nature recently. And then throwing Mike McCarthy, who's coached for both teams. It just, yep. it throws in a realm for both. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully coach will break down this game more uh, next week. Cause I truly believe this is the matchup we're going to have unless Chicago does a tremendous job. And for some reason, the last Green Bay is the second year in a row. Green Bay, you win and you're in. The, the last, last year was Detroit. Let's see what the Bears do it. But still, I think this is the matchup we're going to get. And, Coach, your anticipation to that being the possibility next week. Yeah, it's well, you know, if that if were to to happen, then I mean, it would be a great matchup. As you all mentioned, all the different situations. But you know, I'd be leery if I was Green Bay. You know, playing in Chicago. I, and I, I I know the Bears aren't really that good, but to me, uh, Justin Fields and DJ Moore are 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 two players that the uh, uh, the Green Bay Packers are going to have to stop. Find some way to stop them. You know, uh, the 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 defense for Green Bay has been playing you know pretty well. Uh, they they've given up some some big plays. So uh, I I think right now the 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 main concentration obviously should be winning that game uh, against the Bears, but. You know, and then, then you got. I mean, anything can happen. You, you, you know, what happened with the, with Philadelphia? What's happened with you know some of these other teams uh, uh, in the past? Uh, I, I'm really, I'm really worried about Green Bay going to Washington. And you know, Washington is one of those, another one of those teams that they've got athletes and they, and they can put things together. You know, and some things go wrong. Then, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a scary situation uh, for Dallas. But uh, hopefully. Yeah. Everything will everything will fall into place, and uh, I'd be looking for really forward to that matchup. Well, all I'm saying is if Dallas doesn't beat Washington, and uh, if it's something coach wise or whatever, he's like definitely a couple seconds from being fired or something like that. Oh, because yeah. now there, there now yeah. there's no excuse for anything. Like I said, it's nope. so like I tell you the whole the whole the whole season regular season. I'm telling you, don't worry about it. It matters when they get to the playoffs. Well, now now if, as far as I'm concerned, it's playoff time because you can lock up this. Yes. They play horrible on the road, but still. Um, I, I did want to bring this up and um, with some of the other uh, teams that have the possibility of going into the playoffs. But first, before I do that, Boost, what's going on with your Steelers, my man? What's going on with the quarterback situation? They're trying to make your quarterback look bad, my man. What's going on there? Oh, by the way, I was going to say this. The game, this game is in Lambeau Field, Chicago, and in uh, Green Bay. And also, Fields can be playing like to keep his job because, you know, Chicago sure. has locked up the number one draft pick. And, you know, you got Caleb Williams from USC – uh, possibility there and of course he knows now he knows he's not gonna get part ownership of the team let me just say that right now <laughs> i'm sure he's got to know over that but still there's a possibility like if fields goes out there and knocks green Bay out of the playoffs they might say you know what we'll, we'll, we'll keep this guy we'll trade the pick and get a bunch of receivers and other teams to build around uh fields <laughs> but we'll have to wait and see that i just want to bring that up very quickly but Boots, yeah no I mean, that's true. We just one other thing. I mean, you know, they're, they're talking about getting rid of Justin Fields because they have the number one pick, and you're talking about some Caleb Williams who didn't play in the in the uh, in his bowl game, and the uh, second or third string quarterback for us <laughs> just tore just tore it up. You know, I mean, why would you want to worry about about someone who has not, has no NFL experience? To get rid of uh, an athlete, you know, I, I I'm really I'm really high in Justin Fields simply because oh, yeah. he's an athlete. I am. He's not a quarterback; he's an athlete. You know, and and that's the toughest thing for defense to try and stop. So yeah, the, the, those are my two cents. So Abu, so your thoughts back to my original question there: What's going on with the Steelers? Why are they trying to make your quarterback look bad? He's injured and stuff like that. Why are they questioning him at all? It, it doesn't make any sense to me. 
I I don't know how much time you have, but let's just put it this way, because he <laughs> went to Pitt. Uh, a lot of Pittsburgh Steeler media, they either represent Penn State or they represent Pitt. Um, and, I, you know, a lot of people didn't like the pick uh, way back when, two years ago. They didn't like that pick. They didn't want Kenny Pickett to go in the first round. You had a bunch of people on the opposite side say he was a third or fifth round pick at best. So the bar was exponentially high off the bat. Then, you know, a lot of people pegged him as the second coming of Ben Roethlisberger, which I don't know where that came from, to be honest with you. <laughs> and and so, you know, you look at it from this perspective. So many people are on on one, either side. Either you hate Kenny Pickett or you love Kenny Pickett. And, and that's just what it is. And so Mark Madden came up with this, this rumor uh, the very next day saying that he refused to dress. Um, Mike Tomlin cleared it up and said uh, he was never cleared to dress because he didn't have enough reps. Uh, and basically what I was able to read between the lines, between Kenny Pickett's presser, between Mike Tomlin's presser, and between Cameron Hayward's quote was this. If Mason Rudolph would have had a bad performance against Seattle, then this week Kenny Pickett's the starter against the Ravens. But unfortunately, Mason Rudolph did so well that you can't do that. And so Kenny Pickett's yep. going to have a shot to keep his job next year, just not this year in my opinion. And so, listen, if Mason Rudolph absolutely throws a stinker in Seattle, they're out of playoff contention because of it, and he does not do well enough, it puts it all to bed. But Mason Rudolph threw a bunch of 50-50 balls that landed in George Pickens' hands, that landed in Deontay Johnson's (laughs) hands, which kept it alive. But let's put it back even further. 2019, when Mason Rudolph was the quarterback after Ben, there was so much pressure on him to become Ben Roethlisberger that he didn't do well and so this is sort of a redemption arc for him and I think he's had time to sit back and really learn and he's got nothing to lose let's put it that way Mason Rudolph has nothing to lose so he's going to throw those 50-50 balls he's going to take more chances because he doesn't have a contract for next season he's fighting for his career to extend so of course he's going to play like this with Kenny Pickett playing like he didn't want to lose his job Mason Rudolph saying I have nothing to lose. So that's where the controversy is. Kenny Pickett is going to be the quarterback 2024 and Mason Rudolph might get a job somewhere else, or he's going to be quarterback two competing in the summer. That's just where it is. Really? Who's this yeah. Madsen guy you're talking about? He's your reporter. Mark Madden. Yeah. He, he used to be Mark. a very credible, credible reporter that had credentials for the Steelers, but then he started making up rumors maybe five or six years ago. What's about his name ben. again? Mark. What? Mark Madden. He's not the guy that used to do wrestling, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, you see? And so <laughs> that's he's all you lost... have to say, bro. I mean, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's basically, how, I mean, I, I just find it as we in the media, we don't, we don't make up rumors just so that people can yeah. click on our website or click on the blog. So that drives me crazy. So in the fact that he did that, he got the attention he wanted, but, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and you already told me that he doesn't have credentials to go. So, of course, no, he's they pulled... do that. Yeah. They pulled that. <laughs> that's just, that's, that's just him being, uh, you know what? Yeah, you know, that, that's unprofessional. I just, I can't they, stand that. He, he used to have an agreement to get one Steeler on back in 2019, but then he got into it with TJ Watt, and they pulled that. Yeah. And then in 2021, he made up another rumor that TJ Watt wanted to be traded. Yeah. So, so, so he's know. he's probably one of these guys that wants the Steelers to fail so he can keep hating on them so people can right. go out there and keep um yes. he's one of those guys okay that's all you have to say so uh, <laughs> let's move on to some of the other uh, things that of note uh Sam Wilson might be done with the Jets uh he's not going to play uh, he's not going to suit up or nothing like that so we'll see but um the Jets doing whatever they want to do um Boos, how much does it bother you that the Cleveland Browns won won the division uh, and, and two, wanted, in fact, the point that they're going to arrest Joe Flacco of all people, Joe Flacco. Now, I kind of like the fact that the Cleveland Browns are crazy. Right now, they're the two seed, but they said that they're going to end up at the five seed. I'm assuming that whoever wins between Kansas City, Miami, or Buffalo, whatever, they're going to be the two seed, you know, because they have them as a two seed right now. I thought that, hey, maybe they're – they can lock up the second seed, but I guess that's not the point. They're locked into the fifth spot no matter what. You know, I said it depends what happens. I guess whoever wins between Buffalo and Miami, they're going to be the two seed, I'm, I'm assuming. You yep. know, the, uh, the, the Ravens locked up the division, which locked up the three. So the Ravens okay. can't lock up – they can't lock up the division anymore. Um, and, and it's true. No, no, I'm ta- wins... I'm, that's right. I'm talking about the second spot. About the, the second – because – 
Right now, Baltimore's one, Cleveland is two, and then they have the right. other teams ranked like that. You know. Yeah, so, so they can't they can't finish better than second in the division. Um, no, I'm talking in, about the in the AFC. Oh right no, right now they, in, the, in the in the AFC, they're two. Right now, picture on 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 record alone. So, but like I said, I'm no, saying it's going to well, change after this weekend. Based off of division record, the Ravens have a better record, so that's how they're going to be propelled. Overall, the Ravens have. Uh, I mean, the no, 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 no I'm not. I'm not. I'm not talking about the Ravens. The Ravens are the number one team in football. I'm talking right. about when you look the playoff standings. Right, the playoff standings right now. It's Baltimore yeah, number one, Cleveland number two, and then right. they go with Kansas City. Then they have my they have Miami and all this other team. So I'm assuming, coach, whoever wins between uh, no. Miami, but it's weird. That's what I'm saying. That's why I'm confused yeah. about the situation. No, yeah. but, but but the Ravens and the Browns are in the same division, so they yep. the Browns can only be better than than, uh, than the fifth than seed. Five, yeah, the, the the top four seeds go to the division winners. So there you go. The Browns are are going to be locked into five, no matter what. Okay, wow. so now mm-hmm. that makes sense right there. All right, right. good. But so the fact that they're overall, they have the second best record in the league. And yeah, the, uh, the that, that's what's Flacco. crazy. And the fact that, yeah, <laughs> but, but hey, but hey, good, but hey, good for him though, because you know what? They're spending all this I'm money t- on on Watson. <laughs> and then you got Joe Flacco, kind of like your Mason uh, Rudolph guy that he's just playing. I'm just going to play, you know, and yeah, he's, he's got nothing just, to lose. Can't get rid of Joe Flacco, man. As a Raven, he used to haunt. <laughs> The damn Steelers, and now as a Brown, he's doing really well. But you know what? I like this controversy. I'm rooting for Joe Flacco. I never in my good conscience will I ever root for the Browns. You, I would rather do <laughs> anything else in my life than root for the Cleveland Browns. But um, to be honest with you, Joe Flacco is creating a controversy over there because is, is Deshaun yep. Watson really worth the guarantee money? Because obviously Joe Flacco is doing a tremendous job at basically at a minimum. And you have to bring back Deshaun Watson, who, since his contract is guaranteed, anytime he gets hurt or sneezes the wrong way, he can declare himself out and he's still going to get a paycheck. So I love it. I love it for Joe Flacco, and I love it because the Browns are stuck with a bill that doesn't seem to be justified just yet. But I'll never root for the Browns, never in my life. But go and, Joe Flacco, I guess. And now <laughs> like the Darren Broncos are going to be in the same situation. But first of all, Coach, talk about your uh, – and by the way, Christian, thank you for uh, clearing that up. For some reason, the NFC, it makes perfect sense to me how that works. For some reason, because I'm not really following the AFC, I was kind of confused. But you you cleared yeah. it up for me. I appreciate that. But, Coach, let's talk about <laughs> the success of the uh, Cleveland Browns this season. Yeah, it, I mean, they, they, uh, they lost Nick Chubb. And, you know, I figure when he went down, they pretty much write them off, you know, and then Watson goes down and now they're, they're deeper in a hole, you know, how are they ever going to get out of it? But, uh, uh, you know, enter Joe Flacco, who is, you know, again, in my mind, he's a quarterback. I I, I always distinguish uh, as a coach, the, the quarterbacks and the athletes. There's some guys that, that play the position that are quarterbacks and then some guys that play that position that are athletes and Joe Flacco with experience. He's a quarterback. So yeah, he, he know he knows how to lead. He's got experience. You know, he's got Amari Cooper out there uh, as a wide receiver. Uh, he's got the, his, his tight end. Uh, uh, can't remember his name right now, but you know, his tight end has been running some nice routes up the middle. And I, I think right now that there's even with Jeremy, Jeremy Ford at running back, you know, they're, they're, they're doing pretty well. Okay. So let me bring up the team that he used to play for. The Baltimore Ravens, who are, in my opinion, yep. the best, the number one team, the best team in the National Football League. You went out there, you destroyed the 49ers in San Francisco. You destroyed Miami. I am correct, right? That, that's what just happened this past week, and they destroyed Miami. They announced today that they're not going to play uh, the starting quarterback at all. No. You know, they're no. going to rest. They're going to rest a lot of players. So that means real time, days. I think it's going to be like 19 days that uh, Lamar Jackson's not going to – I think it's 19 that they announced. It'll be like almost 19 days that he's not going to go out there. Now, the last time they were the number one seed or the two seed or whatever, that's when they both got the bye week. Same situation happened. Baltimore lost, you know. So, and that's one of the things that, you know, it's the catch-22. Like, uh, if you do this and they're sluggish, oh, you should let them rest. If you let them rest, or they come out sluggish, oh, you you shouldn't have let them rest. Yeah, it's just weird, you know. But situational yeah. coach, your thoughts of the fact that yeah. Lamar Jackson is not gonna have any live snaps for for nineteen days? 
Right. Well, I, I don't think it, I don't think it bothers the Ravens at all. I, I think it it bothers those teams that are trying to get into a into a playoff spot by by Baltimore winning. <laughs> I think that that's that's who get gets bothered the most. You know, you know these are pro athletes. I, I don't think that uh, 19 days off. It's not like he's going to sit around for 19 days and do and do nothing. You know, I mean, it, you're, they're still going to practice. Everything's going to go. It's not going to be game speed. I agree with that. So, you know, that part of it may hurt a little bit. You know, it may, may take a couple of series. Once he's back, a couple of series to get the timing back. But uh, in my mind, I really don't see it as a big factor, really. Boos, your thoughts? You know, I think the only time that it really should be a factor is when you're not really healthy. Lamar right. Jackson right now is super healthy and he's in rhythm. So uh, the bye week just kind of lets him reset a little bit. But if you're super banged up, limping into week 18, sure, you take the 20 days off and you use it to recover or whatever. But for Lamar Jackson right now, he's playing at his MVP level again. And uh, in those 20 days, it's going to be a lot of mental reps. It's going to be him being uh, older in this time frame and understanding from the last time. I think it was the Chargers that they played where they came out yep. super slow yep. as the yep. number one seed. Um, I think they've learned from that. I think Coach Harbaugh, he can't in good conscience put him out there against the Steelers on Saturday who are desperate to get a win and put him in that kind of hostile environment where it's going to borderline snow on Saturday. I don't think in good conscience he could do that in spite of trying to keep the Steelers out or trying to keep them in rhythm or anything like that because if he gets injured in a rainy, wet environment, it's going to yep. cost him a lot more than trying right. to keep him quote unquote in rhythm. So yep. I think for the best, given the weather conditions, given the, the scenario on Saturday, it's better to let him rest. And uh, maybe if they were playing a defeated team, like a one in 15 team, maybe he goes out there for a couple of series just to kind of, you know, do some things here and there, but in good conscience, man, he can't do that. He's got to take yeah. the 20 days and use mental reps. And I think they've learned from the last time not to come out so lightly uh, come playoff time. I just and I like I said I I, I I agree with both of you guys. You know I've just got to bring it up there. I just think it's hilarious that Joe Flacco also is not going to play because of the same situation <laughs> of all the players. Joe Flacco. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, be, like I said, next week we'll have he, it's going to be a, sleep, man. Yeah, he needs to sleep. <laughs> we'll have the uh, wild card edition of of the surge, and we'll talk about all that stuff. But of all the teams that if you win and you're in, I already told you Green Bay, hopefully they get in, of course, because we're big Aaron, yeah. Aaron uh, Jones fans. But for me, the team, and I'll let you guys pick the team, that for all the teams that if they win and they're in a situation like that, I would love to see the Houston Texans get in. You know, so the, with the rookie quarterback situation like that, you know, first-time head coach, you know, everybody wrote them off. They, they thought they are going to be like the way the Carolina Panthers were where they had the number one overall. Everybody thought Houston was tech, was crazy to move up in the draft and things of that nation. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm rooting for the Houston Texans to get into the playoffs. Boos, who's the one team that, that you want to see get into or have them at least win and get, do something or maybe mess stuff up for everybody else trying to get into the playoffs? Yeah, I could I could get on you know Houston. I can also get on the Colts. Um, you know they play each other, so win and you're in for them. I could go with either one of those. I'm going to go opposite though. One team I don't want to see in there is the Bills because the dialogue <laughs> of Josh Allen and, and Coach McDermott not going to the playoffs. The buzz around the offseason with stories and Stephon Diggs throwing a fit. Gosh, would we have content for the offseason? Because then they're going to think. Do they have to blow it up? Does Josh Allen, is he the next Phillip Rivers? I would love that dialogue just because it's so chaotic if the Bills do not get in come Saturday or Sunday. And, and they're going up against Miami, right? And basically whoever right. wins, yeah. wins the division, but if Buffalo doesn't yep. win, they don't get in. Miami's already right. no matter what. Coach, who, who's a, who's a team that you're rooting or rooting against for? Well, I I like uh, – uh, the the Texans, you know, Demarco Ryan has done a great job in his first year over there. Uh, I think that he's got the future there there in Houston. You know, I, I I'm really rooting for the Steelers. I I think defensively the Steelers can can uh, can compete with just about any team offensively. You know, I mean Rudolph. I mean if he continues playing the way he's been playing. I, I mean you never know. They got Najee Harris. Uh, they got Jalen Warren. You know, they got the, the their tight end. I mean, they, they've got the pieces in place. It's just a matter of putting everything together. But it may be too late now, but, yeah, that's who I'll be rooting for. 
You, uh, you yeah. know, can, can we, Coach, I'm going to piggyback off of that. Could you imagine the Steelers defense going to Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes playing kind of on a down year, the dialogue if they were to lose yep. that game in the wild card? So throw yep. him and Josh Allen into it and – Man, we have some content to talk about. That's for damn sure. Well, the one thing, right. for, one thing for sure, Christian, is that Kansas City, they're going to have to travel. If they want to go to the Super Bowl, it's not going to yeah. be through Arrowhead. They're going to have to travel this year at least to Baltimore. So yep. we'll wait and find out. And hopefully the only thing I'm rooting for, honestly, is that the refs, we're not talking about the refs <laughs> next week. That's what I'm rooting for is that we don't have the same situation. So, uh, gentlemen, hey, I want to – he's doing the Steeler game. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. but That's Brad right, Allen. he is. <laughs> He is, and by the way, they're the same officiating crew that blew the no, uh, uh, in uh, the no uh, pass interference call between Green Bay and Kansas City, and once yeah. again, that victory propelled Green Bay gave, gave Green Bay an opportunity once again if they win on on Sunday that they're in. So we'll see. All right, gentlemen, I appreciate you. Uh, we'll talk again next week. Uh, so for a lot of Christian Molina, the Hall of Fame coach Tony Alvarado, the Marshall Media. Thanks so much for joining us on another edition of the Surge.